apostolic wisdom for the long journey of life. It's a wonderful thing when you get to preach on a text that's one of your favorite texts. We're looking at 1 John this morning, chapter 2, 12, 13, and 14. Let me read. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men and women, because you have overcome the evil one. And he starts again. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. That is the only, the fathers are the only ones repeated with the exact same words. It's interesting. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. The Apostle John's epistle here is nothing if not deeply honest. At least twice, writing to Christian people, he has pointed out that a lot of them are living a lie in their Christianity. You don't make friends doing that. They walk in darkness, 1-6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness... I'm not saying it. I wouldn't do that. You're a liar, John says, and you do not practice the truth. And then zeroing in a bit more specifically, John tells us the first thing that comes to his mind, the primary thing when he talks about people walking in darkness, how it manifests itself. And he says, whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother, there's something relational here, is still in darkness. John writes so honestly because his love for these people is so deep. You, you really have to love people deeply to reach into their souls with honest truth like that the way John does. You really have to care about people more than you care about your popularity. You have to have that kind of compassion. And that's where this wonderful text that I shared comes in. There's a there's a beautiful pastoral balance in these verses. John, once again, reminds these people of the fountain, the foundation under all of their Christian experience, the hope of all future growth. This doesn't undo the challenge of his earlier words, but what it does do is remind them of their capacity to genuinely and openly hear John's words, turn from their wicked ways, respond with divine help as they continue to press their lives more and more completely into the light. These Christians don't have to court spiritual darkness. There's grace here. There's life here. There's power here, a work inside their own skins. And this wise old apostle kind of divides up into these three age groups. It's interesting to see how he does it and applies biblical truth. First, he speaks to children in Christ. Good place to start. I'm writing to you, little children, because... Your sins are forgiven for his namesake. Not because of their righteousness, not because of their goodness. Their sins are all forgiven for his namesake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men, you've overcome the evil one. And then again, I write to you children, that's what we're looking at now, because you know the father. John starts with the children. I'm writing to you little children, even, because your sins are forgiven. I write to you children, 13, because you know the Father. I, 
there is something precious and simple in these words. John sees this great need to talk about the only way to really start life in Jesus Christ. Everyone has to start at the beginning. You have to be rooted and settled on one issue, and the issue, John says, is the issue of forgiveness. We will grow up. Here's why he starts here. Your sins are forgiven. You have to start there. We will grow up spiritually deformed unless we have our birth in divine mercy. We won't think properly about anything else if this is skipped over too lightly. There won't be peace with God. There won't be confidence in prayer. There won't be ongoing joy apart from, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven. Just the children get these words. Because grace is the entry point. Maybe you're here this morning and you have it in the back of your head that somehow you have to earn God's forgiveness or earn God's love. That's not what a Christian is. He's not someone hoping he will one day be forgiven or hoping that he can somehow qualify for kingdom stature. No. John writes, to these little children. Think of little children and how clumsy and klutzy and falling over and not able to control everything properly. Those kind of people. He writes to these little children. He talks about their first experience in Christ to lay the right foundation. And he says, never forget, your sins are forgiven. What are your sins? Maybe... In a, in, a, in a group like this? If you're, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you don't have the hope of eternal life, whatever you struggle with in life, if you could just believe that Jesus wants to come to you and say, your sins are forgiven. At an abortion, your sins are forgiven. I do drugs. Your sins are forgiven. I have a criminal record. Your sins are forgiven. There's something precious that you need to know if you don't know anything else. You're here looking for anything that might help in terms of your relationship with God. Through Jesus Christ, little children, your sins are forgiven. There's something precious in that. That's the entry point. We've been righteous. That's what justification means, if you took the English translation. We constantly need a living foundation in new birth. None of us ever feels worthy, but we're still forgiven. Worthy people don't need forgiveness. Unworthy people need forgiveness. There's this wise balance in John's pastoral heart. We can grow careless. We can lose sight of the magnificence and centrality of the cross of Christ. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. It never did depend upon you earning it or deserving it. You, you, you can't help but get the impression from the last part of that phrase that it's all about Jesus and not about me. Your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I can hold orthodox beliefs about the cross and still, and still lose sight of its meaning and significance. And so John calls this church specifically to collect themselves regularly with nothing else on the agenda to take time to relive the centrality of the cross and the crucifixion over and over again. We call it communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, because we're all to learn together over and over again that the only reason we're ever here is because we've been forgiven. Two, he speaks to mature fathers in the faith. It's in 13 and 14. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. 
I write to you, there it is again, second time, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. This, this uh, walking in the light that John has been describing, not darkness, but walking in the light, it's meant to ripen and deepen with the passing of time. So this mindset is hinted at the way John words his instructions. In each of the three groups, the wording changes slightly as it's repeated. It's only in the case of fathers that it's exactly the same words. Because you have known him who is from the beginning. And he says it twice for emphasis. Children have 13. Come to know him. The fathers know him who is from the beginning. What's the difference? When John addressed the fathers, his emphasis is on it's on a history with God. He focuses on the passing of time. The mature in Christ have learned more than anything else to, to constantly think of their present walk in the context of past lessons, past mercies, past revelations, past understandings. And so as we stand here, sit here, with our Bibles open this last Sunday of 2023, we're being called by this 90-plus-year-old apostle to remember there are great blessings in having a walk with the Lord. Hopefully, the mature don't make as many rash decisions. They don't panic with things that are unexplainable in their Christian walk. They don't have to get all the answers right away. They are less inclined to neat little slogans and prepackaged spiritual slot machines. They've gradually learned, because there's no other way to do it, to see the present activity or inactivity of God, but not just to look at that, to look at the path of God, the path over the years. They've learned not to judge God by isolated events. They've learned not to judge God by isolated events. Here's a picture. Lord, you've been our, our dwelling place in all generations. Now, that's a recorded prayer of Moses and and when you consider it, it makes you wonder. One could certainly find many occasions in Israel's life where she didn't seem to even know God. She certainly didn't follow him very well. And there were times when God looked like anything but a comfortable home. You've been our dwelling place for these wayward children. If you don't think so, look at the rest of that same psalm. I was reading these verses. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your, you see that? By your anger, by your wrath, we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone. We fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? Now, I read that because you ought to sit there and say, what is going on? Verse 1, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. I like that. What is this other stuff in the same psalm? What's going on with all this negative stuff? And what happens is Moses learned to look at the long sweep of God's dealing with his people. He learned that God was 
good even when he didn't seem gentle, that he was fair even when he was just. He learned that God had a plan when everything to be spinning out of control. When you're young, little children, you tend to see life one event at a time. And if you isolate the events of life, if you have to have things packaged neatly, every single thing, and you need an answer every instant, you're never going to spiritually grow up. You'll just spend your whole life whining. All things work together for good, yes. Biblically true. The text doesn't say everything that happens is good. It says there's a God who can, on the long sweep of time, work everything together for good. Bad things happen. Fathers know it. Yet the promise of God is, is so wise and so good and so powerful that he takes all the isolated events, the ones I can't figure out of my life and yours, and he works them all together for my growth in Christ and yours. That's, that's the mature outlook. That's the big picture. Without ever using the term fathers, I'm sure the psalmist was describing those kind of people when he said they were not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. There is this. But the mature learn, they learn to take the broad sweep. Three, John speaks to the young who fight the enemy. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have over, overcome the evil one. This is the only place where he talks about the evil one, just with the young men. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, because the word of God abides in you, and you have, again, overcome the evil one. There's such an important balance here. The Christian life is certainly, little children, I'm telling you, smile. You're forgiven. And that's a beautiful start in the Christian life. It's not the whole of the Christian life. Christian life is not going to be just enjoying forgiveness forever and ever. Apparently, young men, there are battles that have to be fought. There's deliverance from the guilt of past sin, forgiveness, but there's the ongoing deliverance from the enemy, the world. How can I win these battles? Where does strength come from? Right to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. The Christian life, how can I say it? The Christian life isn't just believing it isn't even just knowing. There is much, apparently, to resist, and there's much to, the text's word, much to overcome. Hear that phrase, the word of God abides in you. Some translations say the word of God lives in you. That captures it really brightly. It's not just that they've read the word, they don't just know it, they use it. It, it lives in them like, like electricity, lives in these lights up here. There's an energy that comes from it. Maybe the best way to explain those words is to look at the opposite. If we say, look at, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and then this is an interesting phrase, and his word is not in us. What does that mean? This isn't denying God's word. It's not even neglecting to read God's word. This is something different. This is what I don't do 
at a certain point where the word of God disagrees with my present view of things. And what I don't do is I don't let the word rule. I cling to my own ways. And then John says, but then the word doesn't abide in me. John's point is simple. Strength comes from allowing the word to live, to dominate, to rule, to arbitrate. My own thoughts, my values, my motives. This is the inward battlefield in my life. You can't see it. It's right in here. It's the inward battlefield in Don Horban's life. That's where the devil has to be overcome. That's where my own inclinations and ambitions have to be resisted. His word lives in you, young man. John said. It lives in you. It breathes. It pushes other things out. It grows. John doesn't mean that children and fathers don't have to resist self and overcome the evil one. Clearly, that's a big part of the Christian life for everyone. But still, John's particular emphasis, whether he's dealing with chronological age or spiritual maturity, makes no difference. His particular emphasis with this instruction is young men and women. Young men and women have this particular need for attention to this instruction about overcoming all that opposes growth in Christ. And here's why John puts it here. The young men, you need the word living in you and you have to overcome. Young are strong. They're traditionally at the peak of their power. They're usually at the peak of their influence, their involvement in life. The young are the ones most likely to feel pinched for time. They are fully engaged in the business of life, demands crowd and compete for attention. In our day, both Young men and young women are just at the point where things are starting to open up in a big way. They're just hitting their stride. They're making their mark. They're climbing to the top. And that's the point. There's this passion in John's heart. He's now an old man. He's not young anymore. He's done with that whole race. He's one of the mature fathers in Christ that he's been writing about, but he still has a sharp memory And years of experience kind of burning inside his head, he knows about the dangers the young face on the journey. And if he were alive and he were walking around in our church and he could speak English, he'd tap every young entrepreneurial business person, every upwardly mobile millennial just pulling out into the fast lane of life all who are burning their candles at both ends, and he'd say, oh, don't blow it now. Don't blow it now. Don't get sidetracked just when you need to stay the most focused. Don't get distracted. There is an evil one. Some things are more important than you're able to see right now. Some things are more important than you're able to know right now. And deepening your walk with Jesus is one of them. I'm 68 years old. When I read the text about the three score and 10, (laughs) if I were able to do anything today, I'd love to put my arm around the shoulder of every relatively younger adult here, those who are, John says, strong in their approach to the challenges and demands of life. And I would come and I'd put my arm around your shoulder and I'd love to say that I know from my own experience, I have almost I have almost no regrets that I wasn't more successful or powerful or affluent than I am right now. 
You only think those things are that important when you're in the fast lane. And you need someone to alert you to those things. You only think you will regret not having those things while you're still young and chasing after them. But boy, I wish, if I could do it again, I wish I'd given more of my life to Jesus a lot sooner. I wish somehow I could hit rewind, go back, start all over, invest more of my life, my time, my effort into things eternal instead of things fluffy. Put your soul into things that will grow brighter as you approach death. Because I can tell you right now, I can tell you right now, as you lie, I'm not trying to be morbid, I'm just telling you. You're in South Lake, we got you in ICU, you got more plugs and wires coming out of you than you can count. You know it's fading, you know the time has come. We sing about it when your time has come. I'll tell you what you're never gonna think about. You're never gonna think about what kind of car you're driving. It'll never enter your head. You're never gonna think about how many people work under you at your business. It'll never enter your head. But there's a host of things about Jesus and all of them that you treasured will be more glorious the closer you come to your own death. Those are the things to invest in. Not the things that fade, the things that turn to gold. All right, I gotta hurry, sorry. Three practical dangers. This is how I'm wrapping up. This is my conclusion. So we looked at the three groups. Little children, children, fathers he deals with, who have known him from the beginning. You're able to take a long view, not a short view. You don't live by crisis events. The young, the strong, overcoming the evil one by the word that abides and lives in you. Okay, now three particular dangers. To those who are young in faith, children, here's the danger. I'm, maybe I'm speaking to someone who's just about to be born into the kingdom. There can easily come the tendency to think that your life is too dark to be forgiven that easily. Pastor up there, you have no idea what my life's been like, and you have no idea the mess I'm in. The danger, the danger for children is, I don't, I don't think I, I don't think I qualify for forgiveness. Works for some people. My life is too messed up. That's the big danger for the young children. Your sins are forgiven. Of course, you never get anywhere renaming sins and treating them lightly. I know that. John knows it too. But, but he seems to urge that we do start out in our walk with this high confidence in God's forgiving grace. Got to move on. B, to those with many years of experience walking with Jesus, the fathers. It's easy after many years of experience in the faith to think I'm at the end of my spiritual journey. After all, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Remember, both John and Paul defined mature people as those who keep stretching toward the mark, reaching for what's ahead. Do mature, don't settle. You have a needed ministry to children and young in the faith, and you will certainly need to offer directions to all of those caught up in the daily battles and distractions of life. You're needed. Your voice is needed. To the young and the strong, those just brimming with strength and the fullness of all of life's opportunities and challenges, danger is it's easy to forget where the real battles lie. You can easily squeeze God out without ever meaning to. The biggest battles aren't in your company's head office. The most urgent battles are inside your own mind, inside your own heart, 
the battle to keep, John says, the word of God living in you. That's this wise old, divinely inspired author's dying words. People like we, moving into 2024. I just want to close this way. To those who are here and you're on the outside looking in, I'm, I'm, I think you would know that. I want you to know that your sins can be forgiven. I don't care what your past is. You can experience forgiveness. All of your sins, all of them. The ones that keep you up at night, the ones that nag your conscience, the ones that you think disqualify you for anything good in the rest of your life, the ones that certainly would rule out a holy God. Jesus died for those sins. That's why they're forgiven. And I'd like you to receive that. So what do I have to do? You just receive it. Believe it's true. Look to Christ who died for your sins. You don't qualify. None of us ever did. It's grace. And receive it in your heart.